Welcome listeners to a new episode of All My Work Podcast. And today we have such a special guest. And when you're going to hear the guest, you're going to be like, wow, what is that incredible voice? Or hey, I wish I could hear more of that incredible voice. And guess what? You can. Because the person that we have as a guest today is the narrator for the audiobook of Human Again, Beauty and Beast Retelling. And I am so excited for you all to meet Chuck Wagner. Welcome! Welcome, welcome! Hey, thanks, Esther. It was a real pleasure, and it was a joy to read the book. Well, thank you. Okay, so everyone that already tells you that you have to get the audiobook and the actual book, so you can do both at the same time, and uh, then get your friends the audiobook also, and everything's covered. When we did the auditions for the audiobook, you had told me that you actually played the Beast on Broadway. I was on the study in the original company, and then I opened the company in Canada. So all in all, I played uh, the Beast for five years. And uh, any time I do this, I have to do this for my daughter Paige. This is the noise that the beast makes. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing! How do you do yeah. that? It's a little bit like snoring. It's not nearly so attractive when I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic! So, okay, so um, you were in the, the touring company for it, and then you opened it in Canada... How did, you, how did you even get there? Well, like, no. well I was lucky. I, when I was in uh, on the national tour of Les Mis, uh, one of the guys who was responsible for help, helping putting it on stage for Disney saw me on tour as Javert, and they thought I'd be a good guest on. And so they oh. brought me in to audition. And then when I did audition, uh, they liked me. And um, by that time, they'd already cast Terry Mann as the Beast. But uh, they liked me well enough to bring me in as the standby. So I was the standby to the Beast and guest on for the first year. And then I opened the company as the Beast in Canada, and then I came back again. And so I played it uh, up until about 1999. So we opened in 94, I, I, I left it in about 1999. And it was a tremendous adventure. But uh, wow. he actually did turn it to a beast. Yeah. <laughs> With horns and hair. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. That they cast you as Gaston, and then you were also the, the understudy for the Beast. Which which well, no, part? They cast, me, they, they, they cast me as a standby to both because I could do both. And uh, if you oh. think about it, Gaston is as much of a monster as the Beast is. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right? But uh, it was a real joy to cover both those uh, both those roles, and uh, because I have a big voice, I could sing both parts, so it wasn't a problem that way. And right. it was just a joy. It was uh, to be part of Disney's first experience on Broadway. Oh wow, Gaston is a little bit. He almost has a little bit more fun than the Beast. Kind of? He is. Well, it, well it, it's, he, it's a different kind of a fun. It's fun because he's obnoxious and he's, yeah. he's conceited. And it's, uh, Gaston is cut in the same mold of like uh, uh, Carl Magnus and a little night music or uh, uh, Miles Gloriosus and a little, you know, funny thing happened on the way to forum. Right. The kind of braggadocious, you know, kind of almost clown character. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, he's fun to play, but there's a real dark side to him as well because he's pretty much evil yeah. underneath. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and totally selfish, selfish, which is, you know, so Gaston in a way has uh, has some aspects that uh, Azar has as well, too. So there's there's elements of him as well. I like the, there's, the, there's a subtle reference to, to uh, Gaston in, in the novel that I thought was was interesting, too, that why, why, why create a new beast, a new, a new uh, antagonist when, uh, when, uh, He's his own worst enemy, so I thought that was oh. really well. That's a, for when for when you get to that point in the in the book, everybody, you're going to be very impressed. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh thank you. <laughs> you know, we don't have to do flattery. You already got the job. We already got the audio book done. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Oh. It was a real joy to do. Great. Um, here's one thing I've always been curious about: that you have, you know, you're playing these parts for five years in a row. Is every night kind of a new night of, yeah, I can't believe I'm going, you know, I can't wait to go up on stage again. I'm so excited for this. Is there ever, ever a point where you're like, God, I can't believe I'm doing this again. It's time for a new role. No, it's no, time for a new no, part. No more, no, more like the first. Because, you know, there's so, it's such an honor to have the chance to do this. Right. Uh, the only time I've ever seen people uh, get tired are sometimes in the, in the ensemble of Ladies of Rob because they have less to do. Oh, I've yes. seen actors that do get tired. Yeah. But when I, because I, I teach as well, and I tell actors as well mm -hmm. that the day, if the day comes that you feel tired, that you're coming to work, 
you really should stop because it is a gift. And every night is a brand new audience. They've never seen it before. And if you approach every night as a fresh new night, you're going to learn something new from every experience. So sure, you're saying the same thing over and over again, but every day is a little different. And so you have to be ready because you don't know what's going to come. So if, if it's fresh to you, it'll be fresh to the audience. Yeah, oh, wow, yeah. And I've actually... Um, I saw a show once that afterwards I went back with my friend that we had to, oh, we have to take a picture in front of the poster or whatever. So we asked this guy to take a picture for us. And I think he was part of, I don't know if he was part of the show, but it seemed like he had something to do with it. Cause he said to us, wow, it was a great audience tonight. That the feedback that you get when you're up on stage, like it's real. <laughs> that you actually get. Oh, it's fantastic. I, I, bark, I really, really enjoy live theater because you do get that instant feedback. And when you connect, it's, uh, it's almost like that biblical thing where, you know, where two or more are gathered, it becomes greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah. Right? So there's a real magic that happens, that connection. You become, it, 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 it transcends just an actor on the stage and an audience watching. You become a, a community, a, a communal, you know, humanity experience. And it's, uh, it's, that's one of the reasons why I've been in it so long. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, that's, and that's probably, that's also why the live experience doesn't compare to the film experience. Even if you get a film right. version of a live show, it's not the same as being there. No, exactly. And, they, and plus, you can never capture the magic that's, that works on stage exactly on, on film. I thought that the uh, Beauty and the Beast is an unusual adventure because it started as a cartoon, first, right. uh, as a film, right. and then it was on stage, and then they took that and put it back as a film. Right. The, the new film, the second film, I was not, you know, they changed enough of it. That I, I, I liked it, I thought it was beautiful, but I didn't love it. I wanted to love it, and I, I didn't love it. Yeah, wow. But, uh, but it was visually stunning. The same with Into the Woods. Into the Woods is great on stage, and I thought the, the, uh, the musical, the movie was good, but I didn't think it was great. I think that they kind of, they undercut it by making it safe, right? Right. And so, right. so you never know. You can never tell. You can never tell. Right. Well, I'm, just, I'm just always happy to see people work. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm into that, yeah. Have you have you actually ever had a night where you get up there and the audience is just not responding? Or usually it's just a level uh, of how much they're responding? Well, no, definitely you can have audiences that are less into it than others. But that, the, 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 the key to keeping them engaged is for you to be engaged. If, right. you, if right. you start goofing off, then they will too. But as long as you're focused on what you need to do, the audience will come along with you. It's, you know, I mean... And sometimes things will go wrong, like uh, like sets will break down, or props will be missing, or yeah, like costumes will fail. Yeah, you know things happen in live theater that that uh, sometimes you can make that that might make the, sometimes when the things go wrong, that brings the audience in even further because they realize that you know it's you're all doing the best, and sometimes things go wrong, and it's more interesting sometimes to see it. Yeah, crash than it is to see uh, <laughs> smooth. So, so yeah, every night, every night is is uh, is a new challenge, and uh, if the audience is, is not into it, uh, you can't let that throw you off. You still have to give one hundred and ten percent, and so you can usually turn them around as long as you stay engaged. Wow, wow, is it exhausting? Like you're coming off the stage, you're just like, or is it more exhilarating? Well, a little of both. It's yeah. a little of both. Beauty and the Beast was uh, uh, exciting. Um, uh, Les Mis, particularly, will wear you out. Uh, when I did Jekyll and Hyde, I was exhausted at the end of the night. But, but it's also, it amps you up because you get all that, you all the energy that you give to the audience, you get that energy back. So it's kind of a, a circle. So, you know, sometimes after the show is over, it'll take several hours to wind down just because of that electricity is still percolating, right? Wow. It's good work. It's a good tire when you're tired from that. Oh, yeah. Nice work if you can get it, right? Boom. <laughs> We've made a reference. <laughs> exactly. You play Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, Jekyll and Hyde. You play both roles in the Frank Wildhorn musical. It's, yeah. I was the original Jekyll and Hyde years and years and years ago at the Alley Theater in Houston. Wow. And, uh, yeah, I love that. I love that show. And uh, I, 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 go, I go way back with it. And, uh, but I feel like if, you, if you're going to play Jekyll, you need to play Hyde, too. Oh, it's yeah. Like, uh, that's half the fun, right? Yeah, oh yeah. That, well, from that musical, that song, that confrontation song is, it, it, I think it blows my mind every time. Especially when it's done, yeah, yeah. like, right? Because some people do it well and some people do it right. And when it's done right, it just, I don't, like, I almost can't get my mind well, around it. 
Yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. I do it in my. Uh, I do. I have two uh, shows that I do on the cruise ships, and uh, one is called uh, Living the Dream, and I do the competition in a second show called Classic, wow. and it's all about classic classic monologues from the from musical theater, and that competition is a real challenge. And what I like is that it does work as long as you do it internally. Uh, when we did it on stage, we had the hair yeah. working yeah. with us, right? Yeah. So you got half hair, half your hairs down, half your hairs up, and that's. Um, I jokingly refer to it as the hair ballet, but, but yeah. I'm pleased. To, I'm pleased to report that the confrontation works equally well without without the trick. As long as you, as long as you commit to it internally, you can still make it work. Yeah. Um, but when it really works theatrically, it's a real challenge because you've got huge, substantial lighting shifts between each shift. Right? Boom, 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 yeah, boom, wow. boom. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so when that really works, that visual also adds to the exhilaration of that moment. So uh, I'm a firm believer in the uh, in the communal effort right. of making theater, of theater magic, right? So right. it's a real challenge. We had uh, individual spot ops on either side of the stage. So you've got the, the guy in the booth having to call it, the stage manager calling fast, and then you've got the individual spot ops that have to you know point where the lights have to be. And so it's a real... It's almost a symphony. A little. There's another kind of ballet that show, the lighting ballet. Mm -hmm. Well, there's that also, and then it's always like just being able to remember that you have to shift your voice each time is also for me. I just, I got, I, I, hardly, I barely get past that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, vocally, Jacqueline Hyde is a very de demanding role, and if yeah. you're not careful, you can throw your voice away because you're really pushing so hard. Well, well. So. But, but the beauty of doing it eight times a week is that you build that muscle up, right? I don't, like, if I were to do it right this second, I'd probably kill myself. It's been so long since I've done it. Wow. But when I was doing it eight times a week, I was, like, invincible, right? It was, wow. by the time I'd done it for six months on the road, I was like Superman. Like, it was, it was a real, it was a great feeling to have that kind of power. Well, yeah, that's, well, like, you, it's a muscle. So if you build a muscle, you'll, it will get stronger. <laughs> that, that's yep, simple. Yep. Yeah. Wow. What's it like um, being on the road? Is not are you? Is it like a different city? Do you get to see any cities that you go to, or is it just theater to theater and that's it when you're on the road? No, no, no. I mean, you do a lot of theater to theater, but once you once the show is up and running, yeah. you know, once you've been doing it for a couple of months, then your days are pretty much free because you you know what's happening at the show. Right. So yeah, I got to see. I got to do a lot of great sightseeing in all the a lot of the most of the major countries around the world. Oh wow! Uh, mostly in the United States, but also in Canada too. And, and uh, the people are great, and they'd always, you know, especially if you're coming through in a show, they treat you like you're a king. It's right. It's great. Right. Wow. Wow, 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 Yeah, and also that's a lot of beautiful areas that you're probably in. If you're doing a lot of driving, you're going to see all the scenic tours. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes, like the major tours, a lot of times we would fly from city to city. But uh, sometimes the bus and trucks, we would take buses. But uh, for four years when I was the ringmaster of the circus, I lived on a circus train, and so I got to take train tracks all across the country, and that was an amazing adventure. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I can't... Wow. <laughs> I can't... <laughs> being part of a circus, that's crazy. So how did you get into all this stuff? How did this even... Was this something you always wanted to do, or is this something you kind of fell into? Oh, to be an act? To just be an actor? Yeah, to be on stage and all that. Yeah, I was lucky. I uh, When I was in the... Uh, Ninth, for between ninth grade and the tenth grade, when I was in, when I became a sophomore in high school, we had a theater teacher named Juliet Guthrie who saw potential in me. So she cast me as probably the world's youngest Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> and then I, I did, then I did Henry Drummond in Hair at the Wind, and then my senior year I was Billy Bigelow in Carousel. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so she gave me, she gave me all these opportunities, and then once I. Uh, um, had the chance to audition for things professionally. I had a, a talent scout who came and saw me in Carousel and invited me to do some summer stock that next summer at a place called Jenny Wiley Summer Music Theater in Prestonburg, Kentucky. And we did 1776 and Showboat and uh, Grass Harp. And uh, it was, you know, so I had a lot of things to, to do yeah. that summer. And I've never stopped working ever since. So that's from wow. the time I was 18 to now I've been working professionally. I got my equity card that summer and I've never stopped. Wow. That is, that's pretty amazing. Do you have, is there a particular... Although, yeah. although now, now thanks to COVID, we've all stopped for a little while. Is that part of how you started doing the, that you decided to become a narrator for audiobooks is because you were looking for a way to still be able to well, tell a story? 
In a way, in a way, definitely. We built this studio in the, in our in the house here, and uh, I, I wanted a way to get to do where I could still contribute and work from home. Um, but I've always been um, interested in voiceovers. I did a couple of national commercials over the years, and and I love the idea of doing voiceover. And uh, several people have always told me, "Well, you should be doing." audiobooks and, and I, I agree and I listen to them all the time so I love I love the idea of it. so uh, I hope when people hear it they, they think that uh, that it's something they'd like to hear more of because I I got I'm working on another one now it's not one of yours but it's uh, it's not bad <laughs> and I and uh, I'm starting through you know there's there, there's all sorts of platforms out there that I was not aware of there's, yeah there's a, ACX like that we're, we're working together. There's a thing called Fiverr. Yep. There's a thing called Upworks. Yep. There's a bunch of these places where you can try to get work. And so I'm just putting my feet in the water and seeing what I can make happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, good luck. They're fantastic. I'm, also, I'm looking forward to making enough money that I can upgrade my equipment too. <laughs> yeah. See, it all goes back into it. Yeah. Because I can see from the different narratives that I've got, from all of them, you could tell that you're the stage person. Even though a lot of them have been. First of all, I got different voices for everything. So every single character has its own voice, its own personality, and the way you move back and forth between them, you could see. So if we haven't if we haven't yet convinced everyone they should be buying this audiobook, I don't even know what else could be said. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing it. But well, I expect, particularly there was a one, like one time we had to go back because I kind of went too far. Yeah. You know, I, what, you know one, one is, I've never been accused of subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't. Yeah, sometimes I have to be, have to be pulled back a little, just a little bit. Some of the chapters I was listening to, I almost felt like I was in this. I felt like I was in a theater. I wanted to just get up and just applaud <laughs> at the end of the scene, and like there was no scene, but I felt like it had to happen. And then suddenly I was like, "Man, well, he must be sweating after this one." <laughs> well, that's kudos to you because I mean, you wrote them. These scenes are that wouldn't you wouldn't have that feeling if you hadn't given me a scene to go into. You know, I had to go pretty hard. <laughs> When you had that fight in the woods, that was pretty. It was pretty rough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. between that one where he's attacked, where I won't say who he's attacked by, but that's pretty violent. And then when he yeah. when he meets that giant animal, and he's not very kind to that particular animal. No. It's like, oh my God, these are these are some dark scenes. I had to go to some dark places. Here. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> well, it is kind of an anti fairy tale. Yes. Oopsies. <laughs> I think I warned that. I was like, this is not going to be a Disney fairy tale. So I'm glad you know the beast. But this is a different kind of beast. <laughs> Good. I love I love the characters too. I thought uh, I really look forward to seeing the other interactions with the other characters in the other books. Oh, awesome, awesome! Well, thank you. Good. From all the Disney stories or the more popular Disney stories that are out there, is Beauty and the Beast one of your favorite ones, or have you always wished you could oh, be in absolutely. a different one? Oh yeah, no, okay. exactly. That's what I love about Beauty and the Beast. In the movie, they made him an older guy. He already knew how to read. He was kind of educated. And he was just a. I don't want to say the wrong thing, word. I'm right. going to say. Uh, I won't say that. He was yes. just a, a pomp let's say a pompous, unpleasant fellow. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Which is kind of unfortunate because what I like about the Beast in the state play is that he, he was changed into a Beast at a pretty young age. Yeah. Like before he learned to really, before he learned to read. So there was an innocence to him that you lose by making him snide like that, right? Right. So right. I like the fact that he's still basically a child, even though he's a full-grown and giant Beast. He, uh, there's still a childlike quality to him. That childlike quality is why I like to, to play the Beast so much. And then when he finally does let her go, it's uh, heartbreaking, right? Because oh, yeah. he's allowed himself to uh, to let her go. Whereas, you know, in the movie, they wrote that new song for him called uh, uh, Ever After, right? Yeah, or Evermore or something okay. like that, yeah. Evermore, Evermore, right? Evermore. Yeah. Right? Evermore. And uh, Ever After, that's your book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that song Evermore is nice. But if I can't love her at the end of Act One in the original musical is nearly suicidal. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. he, you know, because he's his heart is breaking. Whereas Evermore in the new movie, it's basically he says, "Well, I love her. If she doesn't come back, it's okay because I understand now, and it's okay, right? And yeah. so it's fine. But it just didn't have the stakes, right? It wasn't as the drama was lighter. It wasn't. It didn't go as deep." So it's not necessarily that you don't necessarily mind if they added songs to it. You just thought that they could have, it, you just didn't think that that particular song hit the right, well, notes, I guess you could say. No, I, thought, I, thought yeah. it, I thought it was a beautiful song. I just, I thought that by, by him saying basically, 
that, you know, because in my show, he feels like he's let her go and she'll probably never come back and he's, he's sad and it's over. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. He figures that's it. Yeah. Here he says, even if she doesn't come back, it's okay. We're, we will die knowing that I, at least I understand what love is now, which is not a bad thing. But right. there wasn't the pain, right? There was such a, there was almost an acceptance of it. Yeah, with, yeah. With ever, as opposed to the the sadness of it, and I think the sadness takes the drama to a to a deeper place, so that when she finally does come back, there's a joy as opposed to it's like, oh, oh, you're back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here she is. Yeah. Although technically, although technically he physically died here and then is resurrected, so in in the it, it can be argued whether the beast actually died. Right. Um, right. In the stage play, here you actually have to have the, the in, in the movie the fairy actually came back and literally resurrected the guy. So now we're talking we cross over to there's weird religious theology there. So I mean it becomes <laughs> there's things to deal with, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Oh I yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I loved it all. I, there, you, you can't you can't do a bad Beauty and the Beast for my money. The best <laughs> one, if you want to see a beautiful film version, there's a French version that came out about uh, I guess six, seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Uh, just it's called The Belle of the Bet, and it's just give it if you haven't seen it, look for it. Okay. It's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful film. Did you do you watch uh, uh, Westworld? No. No. Okay, well, there's one of the actors who's in the second season of that, who is who plays the Beast. Ah, okay. In, uh, in, uh, in this, and he's it's just really beautiful. But you'll you watch it. You just you need, especially having written this as a retelling. There's there's rich extra layers to the Beauty and the Beast story in this telling as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, and there's so many um, there's so many iterations of it. When I was first um, doing the the fairy tale retellings, I knew. I knew there were a lot of versions between book and film and, you know, between everything, TV, series, all these things that existed. But I don't think I realized that it's it's almost its own genre of retellings. It's, ma it's a massive oh, world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the story goes way, way back. I mean, it's uh, early, early. I, I do a master class on the history of the play a little bit. And, uh, ah. and it, it goes way back to an ancient Indian one where the, the beast is a snake and a woman marries a snake. And then they've got in the... Uh, what is it, the 15th century, I think, or so. There's a thing called the Pig King in Italy that's a similar yeah. idea. Yeah. And then uh, Beauty and the Beast was based on this actual guy who had that uh, uh, hair condition that made him wolf-like. So he, so the lady who wrote the uh, fairy tale that we're aware of mm -hmm. uh, based it on a real situation. Right? Yeah. So, uh, there's a, there's a lot of history to the play, and it's been told a lot of different ways. Yeah. But it's kind of all, it all kind of goes back to like Cupid and Psyche, in a way. Yeah. To the whole idea of being swept away. So it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece, and uh, I'm just glad that you wrote this book and I had a chance to, uh, to go back in. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, do you think it's more um, like the love aspect of it, or like the redemption aspect of it? Or both that really make something like that endure, or is it something else that? Because there has to be something in that story that captures people, right? That people well, are going to relate to if we could keep I, seeing yeah. it. I think well, the, the the fact that you have to learn to surrender to to uh, to grow uh -huh. is a part of it. Yeah. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting in your retelling of it, though, that and you said it a couple of times, though, that even though he's kind of redeemed and he's never fully, he always carries that dark mark. Yeah. That love, as much as it's supposed, you know, in the Disney-ish kind of turn of events or the simplicity of the simple fairy tale version, love makes a happy ending, mm. la la la, everything, everything right. ends blissfully, right? Right. Here, there's still always that darkness. I like the fact that, uh, I don't want to give anything away, but that uh, once, once they get past that kind of bad incident, and then the, as the years go on and they kind of live with the problem, yeah. right? So when the problem raises its head, she like kind of goes away. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide so you get through this or whatever, right? And he just kind of has to keep it and has to cope with it. And they're kind of, both the two of them kind of go to their own rooms and try to keep it away from their son. Yeah. So there's there's a real, it's, it's really interesting that there's not the, the, the ultimate happy ending. Whereas, you know, you, you said several times in the book that love is not enough, right? Right. And uh, and usually and usually the fairy tale message is that love is enough, right? Right. 
So, so I thought I thought that was a real interesting take. Oh. And, and, uh, and it felt a little bit more real, realistic. <laughs> Because you have to, you it has to come from you. That's what I think. So if it's yeah, not yeah. fully from you, absolutely, yeah, exactly. Well, have you ever had a thought um, in all the years of doing the the story? Have you ever had a thought of like, you know, what if I could tweak one part of it, I would kind of tweak this part, or is just like this is it, and and you never thought about maybe telling it a little yeah. bit differently? Well, I hadn't really thought about that. Now that, oh. you, now that you've mentioned it, it might be a good direction. Usually, if somebody's paying me to do their show, I just say, yeah, I'll do what you say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Well, just because it's one of those stories um, that's been around for so long. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I've been lucky. I've been doing, when we did, uh, I was part of the original cast of Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. And mm. so, as the show is evolving, yeah. we kind of help to contribute. The same with Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, Some of uh -huh. the stuff that happens on the stage comes out of our work on the stage. So right, I feel like we, right. you know, if you're in an original show, you do contribute in a way to what happens. Yep. Um, whereas if you step into a show like Les Mis, where it had been established already by the time I got into it, they pretty much want you to step in and do what was already there. Right. right. But, but, but to me, the real joy of doing any of those shows is to dive into the dramaturgy and to find out what is like? Where are you? When are you? What's going on? What are the political motivations that happened at this time? Right. And do, how do they apply to the political stuff that's going on in your world now? So the more the more you can get into the uh, um, you know the academic academic background of where you are, whether the audience sees that literally or not, the more you can inform your performance. That will com trans it communicates to the audience one way or another, right? Right. So the deep, the more, the more you put into it, the more you can give, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, quick question on Les Mis, because Les Mis, they did the musical, uh, they brought the musical to film a couple years ago, but way before that, there was that drama version. Um, mm -hmm. I think in the ninety from from Liam Neeson and Jeffrey Rush. But I always yeah, prefer yeah, I love, the. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Me too. I I love the drama version. I almost like it better than the stage version. There's something about the drama version that made more sense to me in the storytelling. Well, it kind of seems a little, it, it sticks to the book a little more. It's a little more clear. Yeah. Um, I just remember when I saw the, when I saw Jeffrey Rush uh, fall into the sand, I thought, oh, well, that's like, oh, he's going to kill himself. He's going to take the nasty plunge. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, well, I always imagined it a much bigger jump than that. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. I just watched it again recently, and uh, it's further than it, than I thought when I first saw it. Oh. Uh, but I just love I just love that cast. With yeah, Jeffrey Rush and uh, Liam Neeson it was just amazing. So uh, that's one of my favorite film versions. But there's been a lot of great film versions. Um, yeah, they, there's old black old black and white versions are great too. It's a, it is just a beautiful beautiful story. Yeah, I know. Yeah, because for me the drama that that one drama version focused. I like the focus more on. Um, like the, I guess the redemption, like can a person really redeem himself? And when it's the stage version, they start bringing in the love aspect of it. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm someone who's always like, you know, love is not enough, love is not enough. But it almost felt like in the stage version, I'm like, what does that have to do with his, with this whole redemptive arc of like, can a person ever redeem himself for serving time? It felt like they were trying to mash in too many themes into the one story. Well, you got to bear in mind that it's also about the music, right? And love songs yeah. are easier to write for one thing, and it's more. So you're dealing, sir. Sure, you got the Marius and the. Uh, and uh, Eponine, and then you've got the Unrequited Love. So a lot of yeah. those big hit songs focus on that. But when you play, because I played Javert and I played Valjean. Oh, okay. And, uh, and the Valjean, if you, if you focus on, if, I think they give you plenty of Valjean's redemptive arch to yeah. arc too. Yeah, yeah. So because if you think about it, he's not distracted. There's no love interest with him. He's just. It's all. It's pretty. The more you know about the book the richer your experience with the musical. You can enjoy it completely without knowing anything. Yeah. But then once you dive in and you read the book, and I'll be perfectly honest, when I played Javert, I just pretty much read the Javert part. <laughs> uh, but, but having played, when you, when you played the John Bozon, you have to finish the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, so now that I've read the whole book, it really is a very, very rich, uh, a rich tapestry of, uh, of emotion. And, uh, and, and John Bozon's arc is, uh, is, Powerful. So definitely, there's a lot of other stuff involved. You've got the comic aspect that they bring up with the Tenardiers. Yep, yep. The Tenardiers are pretty much darker in the, in the book too. The uh, 
there's one sequence in the musical where he, where Tenardi is in the sewer and he sings the the doggy dog world kind of thing. Yeah. He's singing to the moon. Yeah. That's that's how Tenardi mostly is throughout the whole book. Oh, but uh-huh. uh, because Master of the House creates him as this really kind of fun kind of comic relief character. Yeah. You know, it all it depends. It depends on how you see it, but I, I love. I, it's one of my favorite musicals of all time. Oh yeah. Well, the the music is very powerful. Even though a lot of songs they start to sound a little similar <laughs> after a while. Some of them because there's oh, no yeah, talking sure, in between. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it was originally written in French, and so this uh, uh. the fact that the the fact that the English translation is such that poetry is so powerful yes, is a yeah. real testament. I can't even remember the guy who did the translation, but uh, I think it's probably more powerful in English than it was in French. Well, wow. yeah, so, yeah, because you don't sometimes you lose stuff in the translation that you don't because you're like, oh, I can't yeah. really explain yeah. it, right? And you, I don't, you don't get the sense of like, oh, that wasn't well explained or something. Yeah. 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 Is that how you always prepare for roles by going back to the original source material or looking out for adaptations or things like that? Yeah, I do. I do. It's part of my well, I, my my degree. Uh, my my path of study was BFA, which uh, it technically stands for Bachelor of Fine Arts. Right. But we always said we always said this meant big effing actor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, but uh, but yeah, I mean, because I appreciate. I don't. I not only appreciate the. Uh, the, the historical aspect of what informs your character, but I like uh, the whole. I like to understand and work with the costume department to understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to do, and uh-huh. the set, the lights, the costume, even the front of house, the people who clean the 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 people who clean the theater at night. We're all part of the same team, right? So yeah. there's. Uh, I, I try to go as deep as I can because the more involved and the more inclusive you are uh-huh. with your experience in the theater the richer your experience is going to be. And hopefully that way, that's why there was a time, I don't know, it's probably, probably been enough years since I've been there, but there was a time I could have pretty much walked in to, uh, through the stage door of any of the theaters in New York and, and snuck in to watch the shows because I was, I knew so many people wow. who worked backstage, right? Wow. Yeah. So uh, that was, a, when, when I was, when I was an active part of the community that way, that was a, it really is a wonderful, wonderful uh, family of performers in New York. And I, my heart goes out to everybody in New York now that everything's been locked down for almost a year now. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't think anybody thought it was going to be so long. Like, you first got the emails oh. of, like, a few months, a few months, and all of a sudden it's like, we don't know when we're opening. <laughs> and you're like, what? I know, right? Yeah, how is that a thing? Yeah, it's crazy, dude. No, it's a mess. And, and I do, uh, one of the things I've been doing for the last several years, I do my solo shows on cruise ships, and they're hurt worse than anybody else. They're, oh, yeah. All the cruise ships have been locked down, so... So it'll be a while. That's again one one of the reasons why we're trying to find things to do from home is because it's it's dangerous out there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. There are a few roles that you said that you kind of started off the original of those, but is there any role that you stepped into that you then have to figure out how much do I have to be similar to the person who came before me versus giving my own spin on this particular role? Right. Well, I think Javert certainly was one of those where you know you get two weeks to come in. And uh, and you have to hit all the marks, and you have to uh, to uh, to do essentially the staging that was there before. But you have to find your truth. You have to make it real from within your own self. Yeah. So uh, so every time you get a chance to do the role, it becomes your role, whether or not uh, the audience thinks one way or another. From your point of view, you have to own it for real. So yeah, it doesn't matter what went before you. That for those every and like it goes back to that. Every show is a fresh show, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every time you go out there is the first time, and uh, so you have to give it hundred percent, one hundred and ten percent, and and plus I was I, I was cocky enough back in the day. It's like you know, well everybody did it this way, and now I'm going to come in and I'm going to do it the right way. Right. <laughs> right. Now, and, yeah. And while that that and I, I think I've grown to be a lot more understanding in my old age than I was back when I was a. Uh, you know, young whippersnapper. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but there but you still have, I think there's some truth to that. You have to find your truth in whatever you're doing, and uh, that's the best you can do. You got to give the best you can. Right. So I mean, not being on the the New York scene, or I guess you're not traveling so much anymore. Is that something that you kind of decided as okay? I have you know my acting career is now going to be is going to be different now, or is that something that is like an unspoken rule that after a certain point. You kind of have to move on. Well, well, I'm not a kid anymore, right? I'm, right. I'm, 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 uh, I'm officially, I'm not completely, I'm not 
see that yet, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, yeah, when I was a kid, when, when I was young, it was like Lancelot and princes, right? Yeah. And now it's king or not, it's king or nothing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I hear that, yeah. So, yeah. and most of, a lot of the roles now, or certainly back in the, you know, from the 90s, early 2000s, a lot of things were written for, for teenage tenors, right? And I'm more of a old school, yeah. you know, Gordon McRae, Howard Keel, John Ray kind of voice. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. so, um. So, you know, it comes and goes in phases, and uh, I still go to New York to audition if something were uh, appropriate, but I have to have a pretty good shot at it before I can. It costs me, every time I go to New York, it's over $1,000 by the time I fly up there and get a place to stay and yeah. things like oh, that. So I have, yeah. it's like an investment to, aud to audition now from here. Yeah. And, um, but uh, I still do readings. In fact, I'm involved in a reading for a, another play that will be coming up. I think we're doing another reading uh, next week. Uh, so I do, that's the beauty of this Zoom culture yeah. is that you can you can still be involved from home, right? Uh, at the at the ground level, anyway. And, right. Uh, but still, there's nothing like live theater. So no, yes, I'm no. about I'm about zoomed out. Yeah. Oh yeah. Out. Oh yeah. In, in live theater, especially like Jekyll and Hyde or things like that, people who come to sit in the front row of the theater. When I was doing Jekyll and Hyde, yeah. you're going to get you're going to get spit on, you know. So you, so we have to be we have to be protected again before that can happen again. Oh yeah, that's like real. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there any one role that you either you could wish you could reprise or that you've never been that you've never been cast for that you wish you could have done or that you could still do? Yeah, I'd like to have been Shrek. Oh. I think that, I oh. Think that that's got some great 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 songs in it and uh, yes and uh, I I've done several of those songs in concert but I think with my size I would have been an excellent trick I just never had the chance to do it you know I'm a little bit biased because I I, I I know Brian D'Arcy James started that he, he opened that on on Broadway and I think I, yeah. I'm a little biased towards him because <laughs> I think it's fantastic but then again sometimes the first person oh, you amazing. see yeah <laughs> he's, got, see, he's got such an amazing voice that it makes it a very hard sing yeah because you know he's I love him to pieces. He was I was in Les Mis with him years ago. He was in my cast, and then I saw him in Blood Brothers, and I've seen him in everything. Wow. I love him to pieces, and and I I wish I could sing as half as well as he sings. Oh, uh, his, uh, <laughs> the, his, uh, his the Stoke the Stoker in uh, Titanic, uh -huh. one of the best songs ever. So yeah, he's he I can't, I'm not saying I could do better than than Brian Darcy James. But because he created such a great role and the songs are so good, I would like to have played that part. Yeah, the songs are actually surprisingly good because sometimes you're not sure when they're bringing the cartoon to stage, which direction they're going to go with it. And they actually, they really flushed out the story. There's like a real story there. <laughs> they, oh, it's, it, yeah. it, it, it's beautiful. And beautiful. And Sutton Foster, oh my God. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're big fans of her too. Oh yeah. It's just her facial expressions. I don't know how she does it. She just, she almost doesn't need words. She's so good. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh man, amazing. Okay, great. Um, well, not because I want to, but I'm just watching the timer, so I think we have to wind up. I sort of warned that there was going to be a fill in the blank, so if you have any answers for it, even off the cuff or off the top of your head, um, to do like I love it when you could you choose either stories or you know plays, musical shows, writers, directors, anything do X, and I really don't like when any of those do X. Or actors, you can fill in any of those. You have anything that you could well, uh, fill in for that? Well, I love it. I love it when a musical makes you reflect on how good your life is. When they allow you to realize the blessings that are good in your life. Wow. And I don't like it when they make you feel bad about yourself. And uh, for example, one of the things, one of the reasons why uh, anyone can whistle was a flop in Philadelphia is because there's a brilliant moment in. Uh, in the play, because I don't know if you know anyone, anyone can whistle, but it's about these crazy people, right? And right. all of a sudden, it turns on the audience and says, you guys are the crazy ones. Oh. And all of a sudden, and the audience went, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> who are you talking to? And so they, they, they couldn't buy it. So it's the same, while I don't think it was a brilliant device, the audience was not ready for it. At the time. <laughs> not so really. I, like, I, I just like, I love it when a show makes you feel good, and I hate it when a show makes you feel bad. Is that's that, too simple, I know. But no, what, that's okay. But is that specifically a happy ending or just a show, that, a show that's got, like, joy in it? You know, because oh, that's no, kind of no, different. You can, be, you, can be, you can be weeping. If, if a show moves you to where you're 
sobbing at the end. Right. That kind of emotional catharsis is still yeah. going to make you feel good because it made you feel deeply. Right. Right. Okay. Right. So you don't. You don't. Have, it doesn't have to be a, a mindless happy. A, a show that makes you feel deeply is successful theater. Yes. Amen. Yes. Very good. Well, that was very good. So I'll take that. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck, so much. It was so great to speak with you. Thank you. It is. Thank you so much, and good luck with everything. Continue success with your podcast. I hope you are the next uh, 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 James Missioner as far as the quantity of books that you write. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, real well, we hope to hear more from you, pun intended. This was a bonus episode featuring Chuck Wagner. To find out more about Chuck and his work, please visit his website in the episode notes. And to order our audiobook, check out the link in the episode notes, too. To find out more about Oh My Word Podcast, follow us on Instagram, Oh My Word Podcast, or check out www.eltenabound.com. Thanks so much for joining us. Catch you next time.